All right. I think we're ready to get started after lunch break. I think, hope everybody enjoy lunch. My name is Thomas Graf. I'm from the Cilium project, and I'm here to talk about extending Envoy with Go. Who am I? I'm, I have a kernel development background. So why do I speak about Go? Um, different story. In the, back, in, the, in the past, I've mostly focused on networking, security, and BPF, uh, and then founded the Cilium project. And we found this nice integration possibilities with Envoy, and Go, the Go extensions is one part that I'm going to talk about today. First of all, what is Cilium? Cilium is a networking and security solution that also does Kubernetes services. We have deep Envoy integration, so we're doing security on kind of L3, L4 networking level, what services can talk to each other. And then when we need to do L7 of our security, API of our security, that's where we go to Envoy. Um, we, we use the power of BPF, which is this very exciting technology that's happening inside of the Linux kernel, and hence my kernel background, to actually accelerate, for example, Envoy. We use BPF to provide a new kind of a new wave of networking that's very exciting. We're using BPF to provide transparent SSL visibility. We'll talk a little bit about that. The way we integrate with Envoy is, first of all, the acceleration part, that's kernel, kernel internal, but then we have a BPF metadata filter, we have a network filter, and we have an HTTP filter. The network security, that's not really um, um, Envoy specific, but we have an identity-based an identity network security uh, model. We, ha we are DNS aware, so we can actually filter on DNS re requests and so on. What we focus on today is the Go extensions. Envoy basics, very simple. You have like services talking to each other or Edge talking to service, service talking to Edge. You put Envoy in, and then to simplify dramatically, Envoy looks something like this. You have a filter chain that does filtering and then the actual proxy functionality. Where do Go extensions fit in? They run on top. So they hook into the filter chain and allow a filter to call into the Go extension, do something with the data, and return a verdict. What is the motivation for all of this? Secret plot to get Matt and to embrace Golang, right? <laughs> we're, we're going really far. Like we're already implementing C++ exceptions. Um, we will support Go++. If you don't know about what, what I'm talking about, follow Matt on Twitter. Uh, you will be entertained. What is the real motivation, though? Making, making Envoy data aware, right? Let's look at the types of service communication we have. We have kind of edge to service. Envoy does this very, very well already. It's mostly HTTP. It's about SSL termination. We have service to service communication. Still mostly HTTP, some gRPC. There's things like mutual TLS. Envoy does this really well. But what about services accessing data, resources? Databases, storage, S3, Kafka, Cassandra, Memcached, Redis, Kafka, and so on. We want to make Envoy perfect for that as well. This is where Go extensions fit in. We'll, we'll learn about that. And also the SSL visibility, because that data is typically encrypted. And you cannot typically change your applications to just do clear text to AWS S3, for example. Design printables, this is pretty boring. They need to be clean and simple. Uh, they need to be safe and flexible. This may be more important, right? So if a Go extension crashes, it should not bring down Envoy with it. Um, the extension should be loadable at runtime. So we don't actually want to restart Envoy when we load a Go extensions. And we want to preserve the good performance metrics and semantics that Envoy has. So native execution speed, that's why we picked Go to actually compile, compile into a native language, but also to have zero copy data exchange between the Go extensions and Envoy. How does this all work? So this is where Cilium comes in. You run your stack. You basically run Cilium as the so-called CNI layer. We can also run in different modes, but if you're running Kubernetes, you would choose Cilium as your CNI plugin. We will run an agent. You will then tell the Cilium agent via a CRD or REST API, hey, I actually want to like, plug in a Go extension. You will say it should apply for this particular service. You can specify this via service label or pod label or IP address, some selector that we can kind of identify for what connections should the Go extensions run. Cilium will then go on and actually start Envoy if it's not already run, running, and then configure a listener that listens on a port, and that listener will have the, the information to actually invoke that Go extension as part of the filter. It will then load a shared library which contains the Go extension, right? 
At this point, Envoy is already hooked into the Go extension, and for every, for every data connection that the, the listener handles, the data will go to the Go extensions, and the Go extensions can parse that data and return a verdict. The, 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 kind of the connection is not yet flowing through Envoy, so the last step is actually to configure and redirect that will redirect all connections through Envoy uh, so the Go extensions can actually see the data. This is how, uh, how, actually one thing that I missed here is that there is a key value portion in the CRD, kind of just key value, that is passed into the Go extension. So why the CRD or REST API you can basically configure your Go extensions to, for example, embed a policy like this. This is how we do Cassandra. We have already used this Go extension framework to implement a memcached and Cassandra parser. This is how you would configure it, right? You would say, hey, for, for any, any service that matches App Cassandra uh, on port 9042, redirect this to the Cassandra Echo extensions, and by the way, pass in uh, the following key, key value table, which then specifies this policy that says, you can only do a select on my table and all other Cassandra calls would be rejected. So this is one example. You can use this for anything you'd like. It is not, it's not limited to policy at all. This is how the API looks like. It's very basic. So the Go extension gets the data as the connection sees it. And the Go extension can then basically return a verdict. First of all, it can say, hey, I need more data. I cannot parse the entire headers yet. Need more data. You can pass on data, like n number of bytes. You can say, I actually want to send something back to the original sender. You can inject bytes into both, in, in, into both directions. Or you can say, hey, something went wrong. There is a parse error. Please terminate the connection. So it allows us to control uh, Envoy's proxy behavior. In the future, we can add additional API calls or additional API verdicts to actually influence, for example, the local balancing behavior of Envoy. I talked about this acceleration. This is where like, the BPF part um, plays a big role. So if you typically plug in Envoy on kind of a, using an IP tables redirect, for example, if you're running Istio or something like this, it kind of looks like this. So it, a lot, all of the connections go through the stack down, or down really onto Ethernet level, over the loopback, and back up into Envoy, and then back out. Uh, this is using TCP, which was written for a lossy environment. But if you're running the proxy on the same node as the service, there's not really no reason to do TCP, which is why if you run Cilium using a reasoned enough kernel, you will get something like this. We will detect that, hey, your service is talking to the sidecar locally. We will simply copy the data from one socket to the other, and you get performance increase like this. You basically get Unix domain socket speed for TCP sockets without having to repoint your application to a Unix domain socket or to Envoy uh, or to, to use some, some other means to talk to Envoy. Um, I will not go into all of the details. Overall, it's about three to four X faster for persistent HTTP connections. It's also faster um, even if you point your apps directly to Envoy, uh, like 127.01. The last piece that we need for the data visibility, as I mentioned, is like visibility into SSL. Like if typically you talk outside of your cluster, it's usually SSL encrypted and you would not have the data visibility. Right, so TLS would happen inside of the service. We have transparent SSL visibility using KTLS, which is kernel TLS. What we do is we defer the encryption from inside the service where the SSL library is running to after in the kernel, right? So the, the, the handshake to, to uh, negotiate the keys, that's still all happening in the SSL library, but then the actual encryption is happening later. The reason why was this was done is Facebook and others have done this to more efficiently provide uh, video streams over SSL. By doing this in the kernel, it's about 3-4% three, four, three, four faster. That was the original motivation why to do this. We're using this to basically provide Envoy visibility into data even if the application uh, is encrypting the data. This is not 100% transparent, it's like 95. The SSL library running in the application has to basically say, yes, I support KTLS. OpenSSL already supports this, but the library can say, hey, I don't want to do this. So we cannot force the application to do this, but the application by default, if it's using an OpenSSL library, will do this. Um, we have a flexible proxy model. You can run us in kind of the sidecar mode where the Envoy is running in the service, but we also have a model where we run one Envoy per node, and then we transparently redirect connections into Envoy, kind of a shared proxy model. This is interesting if you're running a lot of services on a, on a particular node, you don't actually have to spin up many, many Envoy instances, plus you don't have to modify any of your apps. This mode also obviously works for non-containerized uh, workloads very well. 
To summarize this, like Envoy, I don't have to talk much about. It's, often, it's effectively more than just an effective or efficient L7, L4 to L7 proxy. Um, we have Go extensions which run on top of Envoy. They're loaded at, at runtime, configured via CRD or REST API. They're injected via Cilium, but we can also upstream this, of course, which I think will be interesting. And then we have Cilium, which on, on its foundational level provides networking and integrates into Envoy uh, to do L7 policy on like service to service and also service to data. Uh, and we have uh, inter interesting Envoy integration on like acceleration side and into the, and the SSL visibility side of things. With that, I think I'm just about in time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Oh. By the way, we'll have Envoy stickers, so like Envoy Golang extension stickers. Uh, walk up to me for, to get the stickers. I'm not sure whether we have time for questions at all. OK, all right. There was a question over there, I think. Oh, or, yeah. Uh, quite, like, quite, quite frankly, I don't know how to write Lua. I know how to write Go. No, that's <laughs> the, the, the real reason is there's a lot of existing protocol parsers in Golang, which makes this very interesting. Like, it literally took us less than a week to write Cassandra support, Memcached support. We're just about to add MySQL. There's lots of existing code out there, which makes that choice an obvious one for us. But, like, this is not limited to Golang at all. We could also do the same for Lua. Yes. So the performance penalty right now of injecting a Go extension is about 10%, but I think we can, we can lower that even down, right? So I think right now what we measure is about 10% performance overhead. Most of that is, is how uh, Go does C Go. It actually does quite some expensive operations when you switch context. I think we can lower that even more. Right now it's about 10%.